I want to talk about story selection. I don't know that I've ever actually piece together a talk like this on my on my YouTube channel about selecting the right story uh, in a job interview. I've talked a lot about what stories to tell or the kind of stories to have in the tank, how to, how to actually go about telling them. But th there comes a point where you're trying to decide which story is going to score the most points, which is the story that I ought to be telling. And so I I, I, I want to go. Th I want to go through that today, and I think the you know the the the, the issues here with uh, with interviewing is you know you get asked questions, and you could get asked any one of a half a dozen or eight questions that all would route you back to to a singular story that you could tell, irrespective of the question that was asked, and the story that you tell, and the, meaning the topic of the story that enables you to walk through what it is that 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 you're going to share with them so that they could determine if you're a good fit that really matters and if you choose the wrong story even if you tell that story well even if it is awesome you outline it you give them what they want all the benefits all the steps all the results all the good stuff you can still you can still really lose points because the story didn't really connect the dots for them as to how you would solve problems in their environment in their company or shine a light on the skills that they needed to know that you have so that's what i want to talk about today now the first part of the talk is a very simple quick list that i want to actually recap from a previous video that i did on the six best stories to tell in a job interview so i created a video a while back about what six stories i would actually be ready for no matter who i was and here they are. Just want to make sure that you know how important it is to have these six stories in the bag. And what are they? What are you passionate about? Tell me how you solve problems. What value do you contribute? How do you develop people? How do you serve? Serve customers in particular, but your customer doesn't need to be a paying customer of your company. It could be a teammate. It could be a community within your organization. And tell me about a mistake you made. Now, there's, like I said, there's a video on my YouTube channel about the six best stories to tell. So I don't want to go too, too deep into these. But what I do want to, I want to mention a couple things about this list. It's really important that you're able to do that because if you break down the areas that most employers are interested in understanding about you, I could probably get most of what I needed by the way, on you as as to whether you would be a great fit for my organization and perform well in the position, based on how you told me those six stories. So how you how you uh, you know how you solved a particular problem, what drives your interests, what specific value you can contribute, how do you influence the growth, the development of people, how do you serve the customers, and and times you failed or mistakes or something of that nature. So I want to make sure number one point of today is make sure that you actually have stories responses ready for those style of questions. Those are six of the biggies. But the one I want to drill down a little bit more into kind of the second part of this talk is about the problems. Now, if you are able to solve the problems that the employer needs, because that's ultimately what they're looking for. I have a problem. And yes, I have a problem in that I need somebody that I need to hire to help me. But I have a problem that I need to solve. And it might be a specific problem that you do as an individual. It might be a larger scale uh, problem that the organization or the team is chartered with solving. But any which way, ultimately, your ability to get hired hinges on your ability to show the employer how well you would solve the problems they need solved. And that's ultimately why they're hiring somebody. I have, a, I have an issue. I need to get it fixed. I have something I need to grow. I have something I need to build. I have a, I have um, a, a system I need to optimize. There's some type of problem that they're hiring you to solve. And it, if I was going to, to figure out how much time I wanted to spend preparing for interviews, I would spend a significant portion of my prep time trying to ascertain or discover what are the specific problems that they likely want me to solve. Now, some of that is going to come in through the job description. Some of that you're just going to need to be a good Dick Tracy and investigate, and there's ways to do that. So I want to talk about how I would spend some time 
uh, in preparing for this particular situation, the problem that is. What, ask yourself, so kind of prep number two here, what is it uh, that are the primary problems or challenges they have? So just think about, you know the type of job you're interviewing for. You might, you probably have a job description or at least a high level understanding. Of, of what it is that they want you to do. But how much time do you give to thinking about what are the problems they actually need me to solve? What's one of the things I, I talk with, with you about when I say if you're going on informational interviews, what's one of the first questions that you want to ask them is what challenges are you facing right now? You want to try to do your homework so that you're actually considering what are the primary problems. Is it that they need to build a system? Is it that they don't have an automated way to track something? Is, is it that they build uh, semiconductors? There's, there's obviously hardware optimization, software optimization, all those other things that would go along with it. How do I actually build this the fastest, the cheapest? Whatever it is that they're trying to overcome. This is where you're gonna win the interview because this is the thing that they're looking for. Does this person have the skill set and desire to do this effectively. So this is something that I want, I want you to spend a lot of time considering. Now, this is, this is one thing to consider. How many of you, show of hands, let, let's go to, the, go to the chat real quick here, but how many of you would say that you spend at least 25% of your prep time trying to analyze, assess, research, Identify story, once you discover, identify stories for that. If you're not spending a quarter of your prep time doing that, I think you're not spending enough time. How many of you would say that you do spend at least 25% of your prep time for an interview doing that? Let me know. Give me a yes or no. I really would love to know that because you should be obsessing over that. That should be, that should be the number one thing. Second thing here generally look at, based on their product and service, what would be the company's typicals, typical problems that they would have related to that. They are a small entrepreneurial uh, organization that sells an app, right? What kind of problems will they have? If I'm the, on the marketing team, I know they're going to have a lot of issues with trying to get um, this their brand out there. I received an email from an app that's pretty new uh, because I have a podcast, and somebody from the team on the app reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to be included in their list of top mentors. Would I be willing to join the app? Would I connect my podcast? Would I do a number of these things? There's ways for people to discover me and so on. Somebody on the marketing team did that, right? So how am I gonna get the right talent or how am I gonna get people to use it or how am I gonna increase brand awareness? If I'm what, an engineer, aren't they going to need people to make sure that this is optimized for iOS and Android use and whatever operating systems that an app can be deployed on? Those are the, the biggies, right? So, so those kinds of things, what is it that they likely would need me to do, not just from my perspective, but in general? Let me look at the chat here. So somebody, a lot of you are saying, uh, yes, you spend at least 25% of your time uh, no, some, some are saying yes, some are saying no, but there, there are a lot of people who do spend that amount of time. And so, so I want to make sure that you recognize that if you're, if not every moment of your life when you spend doing something is going to yield, right, the same as another moment of your life or another minute of your life, but investigating their problems is going to yield, yield high stuff as well as looking at in general, just think through. Now, you could take it another step further, and I've just given you a sample here, but what if you did a LinkedIn LinkedIn, so to speak? Why not, why not look at people at that organization who are potential teammates or work in the same unit, or maybe they work in a whole different region in a, in, in a different type of division, but they have a similar type of title and function as you would? Look at their LinkedIn profile. What are they talking about? What have they solved? What accomplishments have they highlighted? 
why not look at their at their profiles and see hmm, they streamlined this process that enables them to they built an analytics tool that enabled them to right what is it that they're that they're sort of bragging about on their on their profiles and and you could look at you could look at their websites employee profiles if they have them any kind of employee case studies or or uh, messages that they're sharing any kind of white papers anything related to that 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 talks about problems they've solved accomplishments they've attained it could also be awards it could be it could be that they're in the news for building something it could be anything that's going to give you a clue as to what they're working on that's going to give you ideas of what potential problems they have or what initiatives they're working toward this is really really going to help you if you do that so so the so just to recap this little portion here i want to make sure you're ready with these six these are the big six I would spend the most time making sure that these things are in order. As far as the stories you're going to have to tell, I'm not talking about the tell me about yourself and all that other good stuff, but you can embody a lot of this in the tell me about yourself. Passion, problems, value, how do you develop people, how do you serve the customers, and the mistakes that you make, and the problems is to me one of the biggest things that you need to highlight because most employers are going to be interested in your hard skills related to how you can do the function which is in turn related to how you'll be able to solve those problems so 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 so, so get that in order now I get a lot of questions uh, actually I get a lot of questions and we also seem to just surface this in the one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that I do with members of my my coaching program, my job search coaching program, when we do a lot of interview role playing, and this has been going on, I've been doing this for a long time, and I, I've mentioned in the past, I coach 10 or so people every week, so 10 unique individuals week in and week out, that's kind of a normal coaching uh, load for me, couple of, couple three hours a day, and during these sessions, um, inevitably, a number of them want to role play, or they say, hey, Andy, I'm having trouble um, answering these kind of questions, I'm having trouble with story to choose, and as I give them an opportunity to choose the story and then tell me the story the way that they want to tell me the story, I'm noticing that there are a lot of mistakes in the choice of the story, one, the spot they start the story, number two, the criteria they think carries more weight when it really carries less weight. So I want to bring forward to you a half a dozen ways of considering if given the choice, how could I find the right story that's going to score me the most points? And criteria number one, relevancy is always better than recency. Okay, so who's following me on this? What do I mean? If you have a project, that best illustrates handling of their problems, their solutions, their initiatives, whatever it is that they're gonna be doing in the future, and you did that 10 years ago, that's better to tell than something you did 10 days ago. Why? Because it's easier for them to connect the dots between what you did and what you will do in their environment. This is if you're telling a story which implies, in, in for today's, purposes that you're telling a story about something you've done not something they've asked you to do just yet right so relevancy will always be better than recency because you want to make it as easy for them to understand how you would operate in their environment and easy it's easier for them to do that when you're walking them through a story that's just like what they're about to go through or what or what they've been dealing with without question so given the choice relevancy trumps recency so that's the first thing second thing is strategic is always better than tactical and by the way it doesn't matter what level you're interviewing for i'm talking about thinking bigger picture than thinking very very narrow and you might be wondering well Andy, hang on they they asked me a specific question they want me to know how i'm going to handle this particular thing and they just want me to tell them what i would do 
Well, that's fine, but for the most part, 90, 90 plus percent of your stories need more context. We're gonna cover some of that tomorrow or in the third part of this little series here. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So there's a woman who's in my program and she and I were doing a couple, we did a couple of coaching sessions for an, a, a big a big interview process that she was in. She ultimately got hired and I think she started yesterday. Or day before, sorry, Monday. And they were uh, trying to hire her as a senior project and pro program and project management resource to build out their program management office. And there is a, a woman who's currently in that role who is trying to retire. And this woman is actually a contractor, not 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 my uh, not not my client, but the but the woman who is currently working at the organization that my client was interviewing for, um, she's a contractor and she was trying to sunset her career. And it was really it was really on simmer for a long time. And they don't really have the right infrastructure and processes in place to run an effective PMO. So uh, my my client, my boot camper, was interviewing for this, and she wanted to have a discussion around how to score well in the interviews. And she was going to be meeting with the CIO and the C levels of the company. And so we got together to prep. And one of the things that we knew that she would have to do is talk about how would you build out this program? How what would you do? And of course, they're going to be assessing her for skills. And so when I gave, when I gave uh, my boot camper an opportunity to start telling her stories about how she would go about building this program, she, her, her inclination was to start talking about the methodology that she would put in place in order to build these, this program and then how to run the programs. So all the different, pro the program itself to manage the office, to manage the different projects that she would run because that's one of the things they needed and they did need that. That's tactical in relation to that position. So what I, what I did was I intercepted her and I said, okay, that's part of your story, but that's not where the story starts. Where the story starts is you need to you need to let them know the most important key success factors that need to be in place in order for you to make sure that when you do your job, which you will do successfully, these things need to be in place. So for example, how would you build out this program? Well, actually building out this program really starts with making sure that you have the right way to not just run the stuff, but to look at the business issues based on the company's goals to determine what the company wants to accomplish and what the right project set would be to do that and the right project set it from an inventory standpoint and the right project set from a sequencing of, of implementing the, the, the projects standpoint, right? Certain projects are gonna yield more or move you along your timeline faster and so on and so forth. So what that means is the first thing that needs to be done is getting with the stakeholders to understand what the business goals are so that I could effectively put together the methodology that helps you prioritize, review, analyze, put the proper business cases together, unify all this stuff, and so on. So you needed to take it up a layer or two. And then once that's done, I'll make sure that the methodology to actually run all the projects collectively is in place, and here's how I do that, and so on. All right, so she has to lift the storytelling which she did, and they ate it right, uh, right out of the palm of her hand. And then I got the text from her that says, oh my goodness, I hope I didn't oversell myself. But you get the point that that's where the story starts. And this is a situation where you have a choice of where to start the story. And so, so when given the option, you always want to elevate your discussion wherever you are in the totem pole. So remember this, the level at which you speak determines whether you get hired and what else, how much money you make. You start talking about how to, how to put PMO methodology together, you might get hired and you get paid this. You talk about business stories, prioritization, goals, uh, programs that allow you to prioritize, sequence, evaluate, measure, and so on, you get paid this much. So huge, huge difference. All right, number three. Frameworks always beat, always beat point solutions. So strategy, elevating the concepts to the level of discussion 
that takes the big picture and goals into account. The framework is when you drop it down to the tactical level, but you don't talk about the one thing you're gonna do. You talk about the sequence of events that needs to occur. So many of you have heard me say, you get paid more if you come with a playbook. You get paid more if you have a methodology, sure. Somebody who knows the five steps, the seven steps. So when you're storytelling, you wanna make sure that whatever you're picking has an ability you have an ability to give them a step-by-step -step outline. I'm gonna tell you, I went through the five stages. Hey folks, I have a program. It is the five stages of the job search, right? Self-awareness, right? Marketing, searching, interviewing, salary negotiation, right? It's a framework to it. Instead of, here, here's how you write your resume. What do I do when I get this thing done? Kind of thing. Right, and so make sure that you are understanding that frameworks and, and storytelling with frameworks is gonna supersede anything that's, that's singular. We're gonna talk about this tomorrow. So I, I don't wanna get into the here's how just yet. I just wanna make sure from a criterion standpoint, you understand it's always better to pick a, something that you can give them an outline and then walk them through the outline as opposed to here's how I just did that one thing. All right, number four. Universal language will always whip jargon's butt, okay? So, you wanna make sure that when given an option, you can do one of two things. You can tell a story that will be universally understood by someone who knows absolutely nothing about what you do. I could, I could if somebody did not know how to job search, I could, I could, I could make universal language in how to do that. And even if I couldn't, at least if I could draw analogies to something they can identify with to make relationships of something they're familiar with will always supersede. I cannot stand when I have to stop somebody and say, what does that mean? If you ever get a question in an interview about what, 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 did you, what does that mean? You may as well just close your portfolio, get up and leave. Okay, so you want to make sure that the language is adjusted appropriately. The stories you pick to illustrate something for the HR person needs to be different than the stories you pick that where you're getting a text screen. And even when you're getting a text screen, it doesn't need to be a technology screen, just your domain screen. You want to make sure that you're using language that's universal. Cool. All right, wait, we're on four of six and I got a bonus. If you are enjoying this, send YouTube a signal. Hit, hit the like button, share this please. It really, it really helps a lot of people, plus it helps the channel. So hope, 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 hope you do that. All right, number five. Now, when given a choice about being able to shift something into the future, uh, if, you've, if you go to the Andy Lassavi School of Storytelling, you know that the future will always be better than the past. If there's a way for you to work the story forward Meaning you tell them the story, you chose a story, and you get to move it into the future, that's good. Now, there's a couple ways. I wanna, I wanna be really specific about what the context is that I'm speaking about at the moment. There is a great interviewing tip that I've shared with you ad nauseum in dozens of videos that when you get asked a question about your past, I want you to tell the story, the story that you tell, and then shift the discussion into the future and say, that's how I did it in the past. Is there an example or an issue or a problem in your environment that we could discuss so that you know how I would solve that issue in your environment? That's moving the discussion to the future. However, you might not always have that luxury. So in the middle of your storytelling, you can actually bounce to the future by asking them, or better, just stating it. If you're telling a story that is not completely analogous to what they do, then you have to make reference in how your story has context related to what they're doing. Meaning, as you're telling the steps, as you get through, and I'm in step number two, so this is what I did, but in your environment, you would need to do that. Okay, so you're, 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 you're letting them know that while this is my story, I know what I, would, what I would have to adjust in your environment. 
And all, all you're doing is picking a story and knowing that you will be able to have jump off points very quickly, very quickly. It could be 10 seconds, but where you can take them into the future for a moment. Okay, it's actually, that's called fracturing, but basically you're, 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 you're taking them out of the time zone you're in and you're moving them into the future and then you're going to bring them back. Okay, so, so future will always, will always beat past. And if you, if you have, a, you're going you're gonna to start your story because it's in the past because it's something you did. But you want to be able to make sure you can make references to how this might apply to them. How what you're telling them, why what you're telling them means you're equipped. Because I know when I get into your environment, here's what we're going to have to do. And I'm going to give you a case study tomorrow about how somebody did this. All right, number, what do we got? Number six. This is a good one. So stories that have mul that check off multiple pieces of skills or have multiple stages of evolution always supersede a singular story. Let me give you an example. Another woman, a boot camper of mine, and I were doing some work. She is a researcher, well-educated, um, lots of work in the educational space and worked for or was trying to get um, opportunities with organizations that build educational software. And as part of that, she is a researcher looking to get a research position, except that it's not just about researching and data analysis. In these particular cases, there's funding that she needs to be, she needs to have a skill set from a business development standpoint to actually secure the grant money or the funds or the investment money from outside entities and then and then make the play to them as to how that's going to be used and what the reward's going to be and all that good stuff. That's a skill. Then there's the researching part and, and the domain knowledge. But there's also the project management part where she actually has to run and execute the project in order to do the research, manage the resources, and get the data that they need, and then interpret the data. Okay, that's a triple threat person, right? That's three unique skills. Each one of those may or may not be good, may or may not be strong, except that when you get in a situation where... You want to get hired for your bread and butter, and for hers, it was researching. But she asked me the question, well, Andy, how do I make sure that they know that I could do these other two things? Because I don't want to, I don't want to tell them a short story isolated at my bread and butter, and I want, I want her to lean on that heavily, but in her case, it's a multi-pronged position, which means she's got to check three boxes, not one box. So you do not pick a story when given a question around, you know, how are you equipped to do this job? Can you talk to me about a, a time where you've done something similar to what we're going to ask you to do? Can you tell me about a researching project that you did? These are all, these are all the same question, by the way, right? What, what, what makes you unique? And any of those questions can be answered by choosing a story that walks them through the whole process. Meaning, so when I was working with her, I said, okay, you have all these stories. Do you have any stories that hit all three where you took it from the beginning through the grant securing, through the running of the right project assemble team to doing the research and so on. So we had to then cherry pick which one of those stories to tell. So what I wanted her to do was to be able to use one story for 80 to 90% of the interviewing discussions, right? I've done that before. Here's how I did it. I had to do it all the way from scratch to finish kind of thing. And so when given an option, that's the best option. Now, you might not always have that option available to you, but that's what I mean by going after multiple things. Now, Because I want to make sure that I know some of you follow me really closely and you've heard me say you're go you want to isolate your bread and butter skill down, except that she was interviewing for a position that required these two other skills. So while her resume and everything showed that these, she had the great, these great researching credentials. We also needed in her storytelling to assure them that she had the business development side and the project management side. So those are the, those are the six uh, main ones there. And then one other thing I want to add on the, on, the, on the criteria is 
you have to be able to differentiate what is it they need to know versus what is it that they're actually asking me because their question to me is irrelevant it's it's the it's what they need to know and what we're going to do is tomorrow i'm going to break down um, a case study where i'm going to help you ascertain that but ultimately if you are ever in doubt when they ask you a question there's a couple of ways for you to immediately figure out what is it that they actually need to know. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, if they ask you a question and you're not quite sure what they mean, like, hey, you're going to be a project manager. How would you prioritize the backlog of um, initiatives or, a back, or the backlog? Now, if you're not sure what the backlog is, are they talking about a backlog of enhancements? Are they talking about a, a backlog of defects? And what's so tough about managing this, right? If you prioritize, you take your cues from the business people who should be driving the level of importance of these things. So I'm not, I'm not sure what they're asking me, and I'm not sure what skill are they evaluating. Do they want to just know if I've managed backlog before? So what you do is you, you say... I, you know, there are multiple types of backlogs. Is there anyone in particular you're interested in or why is that important to you, right? Or what's what's the most important thing for you to understand about my ability? I have managed backlogs before, right? So what you want to do is you want to ask a quick clarifying question to make sure if you do not, if you are not sure what they're trying to evaluate. Now, they might have sent signals early. The signals can come in the form of the job description or the signals more likely and even better will come in the form of the questions that they previously asked you in the interview. But if this is a question that's asked early on in the interview, you're going you're gonna to need to be nimble and try to figure this out. So I just want to make sure that you recognize that it, don't assume that the interviewer knows what they're doing. They ask very vague questions and they're not exactly sure and they wouldn't know, uh, you know the, the, the greatest of resource if they came up and bit them in the butt, right, kind of thing. So you have to make sure that you're doing some of their work for them. I know that's not fair, but it is your problem, right? So you, you need to be able to do this. So this is really, really important. All right, so I just want to, I want to recap some of this very quickly. All right, real quick, make sure you got the six down. Passion, problem, value, development of people, how you serve customers, pre preferably, but basically serve, and the mistakes that you make. What are the primary problems and challenges? I gave you a few steps there of how to ascertain them. And then, from a criteria standpoint, when given the choice, let's run through these really quick. Relevancy beats recency. Strategic beats, beats tactical. A framework always beats a point solution. Universal language always wins over the jargon. Past always beats the or future always beats the past. And make sure if you have a multi-pronged story, you can tell that. You don't have to tell it all at once, but it's nice to have it continuously throughout the interview. All right, that's that today. Uh, if you found value in that, again, please make sure to like and share this video. Hope you're subscribed to the channel. If you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week.